the CSS News Center in Kinston, North Carolina, Friday, August 5th, 2022. The Civil War began in April of 1861 when Confederate artillery opened fire on Union defenses in Charleston Harbor. This led President Abraham Lincoln to call for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebellion and preserve the Union. Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, and North Carolina refused and instead joined the newly formed Confederate government. With over 5,000 miles of coastline to defend, Confederate Secretary of the Navy Stephen R. Mallory decided to use armored floating batteries for harbor and river defense. The first such ironclad ship, the CSS Virginia, was completed in February of 1862 and launched at Hampton Roads, Virginia. It engaged the all-wooden Union fleet on March 8, 1862, destroying two Union warships. The Union knew the South was building an ironclad and responded by building the first all-iron warship in the world, the USS Monitor. The two ships squared off in the duel of the ironclads on March 9, 1862. It lasted an entire day, ending when the Virginia returned to port. The battle changed naval warfare forever. In late 1862, a contract was led by the Confederate Navy Department to construct three river ironclads for defense in North Carolina. The CSS Albemarle on the Roanoke River, another ironclad on the Tar River, and the CSS Noose to defend the Noose River. These ships were crucial for protecting North Carolina's interior, since the Union had captured Roanoke Island, New Bern, and Fort Macon by the spring of 1862, putting Kinston on the front lines of the war. The area between New Bern and Kinston became a no-man's land where both sides patrolled for deserters, spies, and runaway slaves. Construction of the CSS News began at Whitehall, North Carolina in late October of 1862. The shipbuilding firm of Howard and Ellis of New Bern, which had never built a warship before, was awarded the contract. That December, about 12,000 Union infantry, cavalry, and artillery under the command of General John G. Foster left New Bern. Their mission was to destroy vital railroad bridges in Goldsboro, linking the Port of Wilmington to the large Confederate army fighting in Virginia. Defending Kinston and Goldsboro was a brigade of about 4,000 Confederate infantry under the command of General Nathan Shanks Evans of South Carolina. On December 13th, Foster attacked the entrenched Confederate defenses on the south side of the Neuse River. Federal troops crossed the swamp in front of the Confederate position and turned its left flank, sending that portion of the troops retreating north across the Witten Bridge and back into Kinston. Evans thought that all his men were safely across and ordered the bridge to be fired. However, some 400 men of Evans' command were still on the south side of the river and were captured in the race for the burning bridge. Union forces extinguished the flames, crossed the river, and camped near Kinston that day. Evans retreated and the Union troops resumed their march toward Goldsboro the following day along the south bank of the Noose River. During this advance, Union forces discovered the CSS Noose being built at Whitehall now called Seven Springs, and shot the news with rifle rounds and artillery shells, delaying its construction by more than six weeks. They attempted to burn it, but the hull was on the north bank of the Noose River and couldn't be reached. The Noose entered the river as only a rough wooden shell. She arrived in Kinston in the late spring of 1863 to be outfitted for war, with interior machinery, boilers, and steam engines. Her first captain, Lieutenant William Sharp, acquired the initial armor plating and almost 100 men from Hoke's Confederate Army Brigade assisted with finishing the ship's construction, but the noose desperately needed a crew. The officers were professionals, but the Confederacy was short on manpower. Men were transferred from the Army to the Navy, and many men who had never been on a ship suddenly found themselves in the belly of an ironclad monster. Lieutenant Richard Bacot wrote his sister, We drill the crew every morning at 9 and every evening at 5.30. We have one or two good men for a nucleus, but I'm afraid the others can never learn anything about a gunboat. You ought to see them in the boats. It is too ridiculous. They are all legs and arms, and while working at the guns, their legs get tangled in the tackles, and they are always in the wrong place and in each other's way. 
In February 1864, as work continued to complete her, the news got a new commander, Lieutenant Benjamin Loyal. By April of 1864, the ship was ready to launch. On April 22, 1864, the news was ordered to assist the Army in an attempted recapture of Newburn, but around half a mile downriver, the ironclad grounded on a sandbar. Bacot writes, We tried very hard to get her off, but her great weight and the strength of the current were too much for us. Besides, the river was falling at the rate of three-quarter inches per hour. The stern of the vessel is afloat, but the bow is four feet out of water. Upstate rainfall finally raised the river's waters and rescued the ship. By the time she was free, the coordinated attack on Newburn had been abandoned, and the noose was tied up dockside in Kinston once again. That August, the noose received her final commander, North Carolina native Joseph Price. But the ship continued to sit in Kinston, mostly serving as a deterrent to Union Navy and Federal troops. By March of 1865, however, the situation around Kinston had drastically changed. Fort Fisher had fallen in January, Wilmington in February, and Union General William T. Sherman's troops had crossed into the state from South Carolina. Union troops under the command of Major General Jacob Cox and Major General John Schofield were now heading for the crucial railroad junction of Goldsboro, where the Union forces were to meet. Along the way, Cox and Schofield found the remnants of several understrengthened Confederate divisions waiting for them just outside of Kenston, near the crossroad of Wyas Fork. Over a three-day battle, the outnumbered Confederates managed to slow down the Union troops, but not defeat them. Captain Price received orders to assist the local troops with defense and then destroy the ship to keep it from falling into enemy hands. New gunner Eugene Williams wrote, For 40 minutes prior to abandoning her, we shelled the enemy on the opposite side of the river vigorously. That booming was her funeral knell. The crew of the Noose, some of whom had been on board for over a year, now had to destroy her. Williams continued. An instant after the dense columns of smoke were rolling from the force of the noose, how greatly the red flames of fire licked her noble sides, how splendidly she devoured. The war ended almost two months later. However, the noose was not forgotten. In late 1865, the firm of Satterley and Lyons descended on the wreck, recovering nearly everything of value, but the U.S. government retained the guns. Everything else was sold off, and the ship was largely ignored for the next 100 years. With the centennial of the war in the 1960s, new interest developed around the CSS news. Henry Casey, Lemuel Houston, and Thomas Carlyle formed a partnership to try and raise the ship. One local man, Bill Rowland, documented their efforts. This group conducted a salvage operation, viewing it as an economic opportunity. It was not an archaeological recovery. Significant portions of the ship were removed, damaged, or destroyed. Then, parts of the Copper Dam broke off and winter rain flooded the site. The flooding brought new questions about who the wreck belonged to. Casey, Houston, and Carlisle are the landowners adjacent to the wreck. Finally, the state of North Carolina stepped in and claimed it, paying both parties. Now the recovery could continue. The Confederate Centennial Commission of Lenore County and many local citizens also assisted financially with the recovery. Finally, in 1963, D.C. Murray, house movers from Rose Hill were hired to raise the news. That summer, the ship finally emerged from the Noose River, but she proved to be too heavy to move in one piece. The ship was cut into three pieces and moved to state-owned land at the Caswell Memorial Park on West Vernon Avenue, where a concrete and steel shelter was built. This was her home for almost 30 years. But the flooding from Hurricane Fran in 1996 almost reclaimed the ship. Two years later, the Noose was moved into a new shelter closer to Vernon Avenue. Hurricane Floyd destroyed the old visitor center in 1999 and would have ruined the remains of the noose had she not been moved. The ship clearly needed a new home, someplace climate controlled that could showcase exhibits. A building in downtown Kinston was purchased along with an adjacent lot, and in 2009, work began to transform it into an interpretive center for the CSS news. In the summer of 2012, all 105 tons of the ship's remains traveled over three road miles to its new permanent home at 100 North Queen Street. After extensive preparation and work, the new CSS News Civil War Interpretive Center finally opened on March 7, 2015, on the 150th anniversary of the Ironclad's destruction. Today, it remains the premier site for learning and understanding the role of the Civil War in Eastern North Carolina.
diamond hole design. Ironclads in North Carolina. It's a Wilmington waterfront, 1875. The CSS album wall, sister ship to the noose. Eighteen sixty three map of Kinston. Radical Naval Experiment. Spar Torpedo. Trunnel is a device used to fasten a wooden plank to the framework of a ship. The trunnel is fitted with a wooden wedge at its tip, which ensures a tight fit. caulking process, wooden planking on the ship, caulking is the means by which wooden planking on a ship's hull or deck is made watertight. These are tools, shipbuilders used a variety of tools to build the CSS nooses, wooden hull and white hull. Number five, there's a blacksmith's punch. Six is a swage block. Got a file there. And a chisel, a very, very long chisel, number 10. And over here are ship's fastenings. Partially threaded bolt, 
an eye bolt or pin bolt. You got nails, you got cut nails, a bolt with barbs, spikes, and square stock. This is quite the museum they have here in Kensington. The ship's bell for the CSS News. The armor plate. The armor helped protect the ship from enemy shells fastened to the sides and edges of the hull above the waterline. The grappling hook, a cast hoist, anchor locking bar. Check this chain out. Forged iron, but it looks like wood. That's incredible. This is a ship's ladder. Circa 1863. And down here, a closed hook, a bracket, a bar, wall hooks, butt hinge, a lock, a door handle, padlock, a key, strap hinge, hasps, staples, wing nut, hose fitting and coupling, bilge pump strainer, double sheave, pulley or block, a couple of sheaves, a rope fragment. Recovered from the gunboat. It's hemp circa 1863. And uh, some binder hooks and cargo hooks. They have a metal framework to represent the top from, I guess the water line up. Pretty big boat. You can see a light in the background waving back and forth like a ghost has it, but it looks like it's in front of an air conditioner vent. Casemates layers. The CS Noose's casemate was the top angled octagonal part of the boat where the guns and pilot house were located. Since this was the most exposed part of the boat, it was layered in wood and metal for protection from attack. Number one, number one is the forward hatch, which is over here on the replica. That would be that. Number two, uh, grading mounts from the steam boiler used to power the gunboat. Here's an armor plate. Looks to be about 12 to 14 feet long. Ballast stones back here. Used to balance the ship. This is a casemate fragment. A fragment of the casemate, which is the long angled side walls, and it can be seen here in a replica. And then, lastly, is this vent. Second National Confederate flag reproduction. This type of ensign was flown from the ship's stern. Wool bunting cotton, eight foot six by sixteen feet. A 
I'm moving on over here to this replica of the casemate. The superstructure and the pilot house up top. This cannon. Pretty big. As you come around, you can go inside this. You just can ring the bell. Whoa. Be easy to bump your head in here. Watch your head, lads. This cannon looks extremely heavy. They can swing the back end left or right. There's the tackle. The noose was outfitted with two 6.4 Brook rifles mounted on swiveling carriages and placed at opposite ends of the casemate. Rifles were more accurate than smoothbore cannons because their barrels were rifled or containing spiral grooves that created a spin on the projectiles and allowing them to fly straighter and farther. The noose's rifles could fire straight fore and aft at 90 degrees broadsides and at a 45 degree angles fore and aft. This is some of the tackle used to move the heavy artillery. Artillery shells, gunpowder, tank, Sponge rammer, gun carriage socket mount with pin in the middle there, a trunnion cap down front. This is a rail from the gun carriage, gun carriage bolts, a belt from a brook rifle carriage in the back, a stand of grape for a Brook rifle. <laughs> There's a canister shot. And some shells with a cutaway. The Brook rifle bolt. This museum is open from 9 to 5. Colt model 1851. It's an ironclad sailor's uniform. Leather shoe soles, a bayonet socket fragment, socket bayonet fragment.
there it is the CSS noose what's left over Civil War ironclad So I would definitely recommend anyone in the area of Kinston, North Carolina who's into Civil War stuff or ships and history and artifacts, check this museum out. Five bucks to get in. And we got this massive ship structure. Climate controlled. Kinston, North Carolina. The noose is scuttled March 1865. Here's a model of the ship. There's the model, there's the real remains of the CSS noose.